So if, if you will put, uh, there we go, Micah 6, 8. This is probably a verse that most of you know if you have any dealings with the Scripture at all. Uh, this, is, this is a passage that is a real challenge. This, is, this basically says to us, here's what living out the gospel looks like in part. In fact, it's a passage, if you're, if you're familiar with the term social justice warrior or those kind of terms like that, people saying, look, the gospel calls upon us to be a certain type of person in a culture that, that finds uh, justice easily trampled on and, and mercy easily not shown. You've seen the bumper stickers. I don't, I don't get mad. I get even. Uh, and then humility is almost a lost commodity. And this, this verse challenges us differently. And then Micah seven eighteen. So let's, let's read these together tonight in unison. Uh, as we prepare to look at Micah. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy, kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. We've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may we take these passages to heart. I'm reminded in reading that second one uh, that Joe Neesom used to lead us at our founders' conferences in, as he would lead us in worship. And this, there's a great hymn taken right out of Micah, Great God of Wonders. And the refrain is, Who is a pardoning God like thee who has grace so rich and free? Who has grace so rich and free? Thank you. Please be seated. Micah, just a real brief introduction. Uh, he prophesied during a period of what would be called intense social injustice in Judah, the, the southern kingdom. False prophets preached for riches. Sound like anything today? God's told me that he wants me to have a, a, a new jet. And he's told me he wants you to get... I don't know if you see that stuff. Now, it goes on all the time. It's just it's amazing to me. A new jet plane. So they preached for riches, not for righteousness. Prince, the princes, the leaders, thrived on cruelty, violence, corruption. The priests even got in on it. Ministered more for greed than for God. Landlords stole from the poor, and they evicted widows. Judges lusted after bribes. Businessmen used deceitful scales and weights. Sin had infiltrated every level, every segment of society. They needed a word from God. And God raised up Micah. He enumerates the sins of the nation, uh, warning that they would ultimately lead to, to destruction and captivity. You ought to be familiar with this theme by now. We've gone through these prophets. But in the midst of the, of the dark prospect of judgment, Micah issued a note of hope that a divine deliverer would appear and righteousness would prevail. And though justice was now being trampled underfoot, one day justice would triumph. That little bit of introduction, we're going to dig into it a little deeper, of course. Let's watch the Bible Project's video summary of the book of Micah. The book of the prophet Micah. Micah lived in a small town named Moreshet in the southern kingdom of Judah, about the same time as Isaiah. And both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel had split long ago, and both had been violating their covenant with the God of Israel. So Micah warned that God would bring the big bad empire of Assyria to take out the northern kingdom and come ravage Jerusalem. And he also warned that after them, Babylon would bring an even greater destruction. Like all the prophets, Micah spoke on God's behalf to accuse Israel, or as he puts it in chapter 3, I am filled with strength, with the Spirit of God, with justice and power to declare how Israel has rebelled. And so, most of this book explores Micah's accusations and his warnings of God's judgment on Israel. But Micah also had a message of hope that countered these warnings about the restoration God would bring on the other side of his judgment. And if you dive into the book with us, you'll see how this works. 
So the first two sections of the book develop Micah's accusations and warnings against Israel and its leaders. So part one opens with the poetic description of God appearing over Israel, just like he did at Mount Sinai. There's fire and smoke and earthquake, but he hasn't come to make a covenant this time. He's come to bring his judgment on Israel for over 500 years of rebellion. Micah goes on to name all of these towns and cities in Israel that are the culprits of all of this rebellion. God's coming for them. But why exactly? So Micah picks a fight with Israel's leaders. He says that they've become wealthy through theft and greed. He alludes to the story of Ahab stealing a family vineyard from Naboth in 1 Kings chapter 21. But also it's because Israel's prophets are corrupt. They're quite happy to offer promises of God's protection to anyone who can afford to pay them. No, Micah says, God has withdrawn his protection from Israel. In the second section of accusations, Micah describes even more how Israel's leaders and prophets have together committed grave injustice. They run the land through bribery, they bend justice to favor the wealthy, and the poor are deprived of their land, their security, and their hope. And all of this is a violation of the laws of the Torah, which declare it illegal to sell land that belongs to families, even if they're poor. And so we find out that God's judgment is going to take the form of an oppressive nation that comes to take out the northern kingdom and Jerusalem and its temple, which will be reduced to ruins. Now these are very stiff warnings, and they're not the final word. Each of these warning sections is concluded with a striking promise of hope. So first is a poem about how God is like a shepherd who's going to rescue and regather his flock, which is the remnant of his people, and he's going to bring them all back to good pasture and become their king once more. The second warning section is concluded by picking up this image of the ruined Jerusalem temple, and Micah says this won't be permanent. One day God is going to exalt his temple. He's going to fill it with his presence and fill the city with the remnant of his people. And so God's purpose is to make Israel the meeting place of heaven and earth so that all nations will stream to Jerusalem where God becomes the king of all the nations, bringing peace to the earth. Now, these two concluding poems of hope, they're very powerful. And the next section of the book actually develops them further in a beautifully designed series of poems that are entirely about the future hope of Israel and the nations. So we learn that after the Assyrian attack, Israel will be conquered and exiled to Babylon. But from there, God will restore his people and bring them back to their land. And then we learn that in the new Jerusalem, a new messianic king from the line of David will come. He'll be born in Bethlehem and then rule in Jerusalem over the restored people of God. Finally, in this messianic kingdom of God, the faithful remnant of God's people will become that blessing among the nations. But at the same time, God will bring his final justice and remove evil from his world. The final section of the book returns to this pattern of warning followed by hope that we saw in the first parts of the book. So Micah exposes again the unjust economic practices of Israel's leaders and how it's destroying the land and its people. And here Micah offers his famous words that summarize what it means for Israel to follow their God. He has told you, O human, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is exactly what Israel has not been doing, and so they will come to ruin. However, the book ends with another powerful note of hope. Israel is personified as an individual who is sitting alone in shame and defeat. It's a clear image of Israel's destruction and exile. And this individual is watching for God's mercy, and he begs God to listen and forgive. But why? Why should God listen to and forgive this faithless and rebellious people? Well, the poet offers two reasons. First, he says, because of God's character. Who is a God like you who forgives sin and pardons rebellion? He knows that God's mercy is more powerful than his anger or his judgment. And the second reason is because of God's promises. He says, you will stay true to Jacob and show covenant love to Abraham as you swore so long ago. Now, these are the final words of the book. They're an allusion to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family all the way back in the book of Genesis, that all nations would find God's blessing through Abraham's family. But to become a blessing to the nations, Israel must first be faithful to their God. 
And so this explains this back and forth between judgment and hope in the book of Micah. If God's going to bless the nations through Israel, then he must confront and judge the evil among his people. But his judgment is what leads to hope. Because God's covenant love and promise are more powerful than human evil, and his ultimate purpose is not to destroy, it's to save and redeem. Or as the concluding lines of the book put it, God delights in covenant love, so he will again show compassion. He will trample our evil he will toss our sins into the depth of the sea. And that's what the book of Micah is all about. It's a great picture and a great reminder that even though God does deal with sin, and He deals justly with it, sometimes manifesting judgment for it, that he is a covenant-keeping God. He is driven primarily by covenant love, the covenant love he's made to his people. So let's, uh, let's look at a little uh, an outline, and then we'll go a little deeper into this outline of a survey of the book of Micah on top of the little survey that you've just had. The, uh, the place this takes place is, is Judah and Israel. So it's it's a southern kingdom, northern kingdom. The time frame is about 735 to 710 B.C., right in there. And you break the, the book down into three sections. There's the, there's the prediction of judgment, uh, where you have this combination of punishment, retribution. That takes us through uh, chapter 3. That includes judgment, on people in, on, in general and judgment on leadership in particular. The leaders have failed. And then there's secondly this prediction of, of restoration. Uh, chapter 4, verse uh, chapter 5, uh, chapter 4 through chapter 5. And that's the, the tension of promise and restoration. Okay? And then you have the, the, the plea for repentance at the end of the book, chapters 6 and 7. And this takes up pardon and repentance. God pleas, uh, first of all, and then there comes a, a second plea of God, and then there's the promise of final salvation. Um, he's a prophet of the Judean society. As I said, it's a, it's a really bad time for him to, to be raised up by God because it seems like at every level and at every turn, the people prefer corruption to righteousness. They prefer to follow their own way than following God. And so you see the book opens up. Look at Micah 1, verse 2. Hear you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And then in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, we hear this. Hear what the Lord says. Arise. Plead your case before the mountains. He sets this scenario up like the mountains are a jury. Let the earth, ear, hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. And so this, uh, this guilty verdict that comes from the Lord produces a sentence of, of the promise of destruction and following that, captivity. And so you get these three, three movements in here. But then, as I said, there's a, in every one of the sections, it's followed up within the section with a, this condemnation and then a clear note of consolation. And we'll see some of that here in a minute. After sin is punished and justice is again established, uh, Micah 7, 19 says this. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities. This, this is, he will tread not us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. This is a message of hope that he will forgive. He will renew. Uh, so let's look at these, these three sections. This prediction of judgment, 
Um, there's a general declaration uh, of Israel or, or Samaria and of Judah, which is Jerusalem. Those are the capitals. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, Israel. Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah. They will both be overthrown because of their rampant treachery. And uh, he goes through some of the cities to point that out. Look at Micah 1, 10 to 16. I want to do some reading in the text and let you get the flavor of this. Tell it not in Gath, one of the cities. Weep not at all. In in, in Bethlehem, roll yourselves in the dust. You get that picture there? A, roll yourselves in the dust is a different language for, for, for throw dust sackcloth on you. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zion do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds, that is the horses, to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore, you shall give parting gifts to Mordesheth Gath. The houses of Achzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marashath. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald, cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. This, he's calling them to a, to a great mourning, a great grieving because of what they have set in motion that will fall upon their children inescapably. And then there's some causes for judgment. Look at, look at Micah 2, verses 12 to 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes in before them. They break through the pass and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Then he goes after the, the, the prince leaders. Micah chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And I said, Hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil. So you get a real picture here of what's going on. Hating good, loving evil. I mean, you cannot read this and not think about the day in which we live. Where people, our society loves to, to execute unborn babies in the womb. And then, uh, so you have, a, you have a place like California that just does this wholesale. At the same time, they've decided they're going to release 10,000, 10,000 convicted sexual predators from prison. They, they hate what is good. They love evil. Who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones. Who eat the flesh of my people. This, this is, perhaps there was some cannibalism going on, but it's primarily imagery, this gross imagery. And flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Then he speaks to the prophets. Look at this, how this continues. Chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision. For a prophet to be without vision is a prophet being without a word from the Lord. Without vision. And darkness to you, without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced. The diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, this idea of of being embarrassed and humiliated. For there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power. This was cited in the video. This This is Micah speaking now as he's been sent by the Lord. I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. It's a Hebraism. He's saying the same thing, just saying it two different ways. 
And then there's a warning of coming judgment. Look at chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed. Uh, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height, just a pile of woods. So you move from that to this prediction of restoration, chapters four and five, the message of hope. Look at chapter four. Verse 1 to 5, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples. And shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. You've heard this. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This so pervasive is the coming peace that God will bring. That warfare as it is known will cease. But they shall sit every man under his vine and, every, and, and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Of Yahweh here, the covenant God. That's why the title tonight included Yahweh. It's about God's covenant mercy, his covenant love, which never fails. It's a steadfast love that endures forever. And then it says mention of this captivity that is coming. There's the promise uh, that they're going to be judged, that they're going to be restored, but in between that is a captivity coming. Look at this, Micah 4, 6. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those who have been, whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forever. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized like you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon, there's the, the prediction some 150 or so years before it happens that the southern kingdom will be taken into Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, let, the, let her be defiled. Let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples, and shall devote their plan to the Lord, and their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. And then chapter 5, verse 1, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. So here's this, this picture captivity. In fact, one writer I was reading said, said, given how relatively weak Babylon was at the time this prophecy was made, because Assyria was the dominating kingdom at the time. He said, given how weak, it would have been impossible for anyone to make sense of this just by looking at the landscape. But it seemed like there was no way Babylon would rise up to overcome the people of God. In Judah. And then there's this promise of this coming ruler of the kingdom. Look at this in, in Micah 5, verses 2 to 15. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, 
From you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. You, get, you, you see these messianic pictures here. I mean, just unmistakably so. When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its end. Very interesting analogy here. Shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword. The only reason a shepherd carries a sword or a weapon like that is to fend off the wolves who would come to devour the flock. And the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Then the remnant shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on on the grass, which delay not for a man nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. And in that day, this is the day of the Lord. This is the the coming of the king, right? The Lord, that day declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. And I will cut off your carved images and pillars from among you and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hand. He's talking to his people now. He's coming in, sending the king to rescue, but but all of this false worship will go by the wayside when the king, his king, shows up. I will root out your Asherah's images from among you and destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. So that's the movement of the promise of restoration. It'll come... Think about this, folks. Sometimes I read people who say, boy, if we just had revival, if we just had revival, if we just, and revival is a wonderful thing historically, but do you realize that the culture has so far gone that revival would be a, a painful, I, I want it, I desperately want it, but it would cost uh, people identify with Christianity dearly. It would cause an upheaval. It would, it would provoke the culture to turn against us like the Romans turned against the Christians in the first century. It would be, there, would, there would be wholesale slaughter if a revival were to come. And yet how desperately we need revival today. And so he moves it from the remnant to the king. Look at chapter 6 and 7, this plea for repentance. God, and that's where we read earlier. He calls them into court, calls the mountains as a... As a uh, as a jury to listen. People have spurned God's goodness, His kindness. And Micah promises that the Lord will pardon their iniquity and renew their nation in accordance with His covenant. Not, again, not their conduct. When God acts in grace, it's not on the basis of our conduct. It's on the basis of His covenant promise, His covenant love. And he transforms us. He, he, he makes us willing. The, in the psalm, your people shall be made willing in the day of your power is the, is the picture here. But what about the introduction of the title? Let's, let's move on here after that little bit of a summary. Micah comes from this, uh, from this place of uh, Morasheth. He leaves the area he would be familiar with very much like Abram was called to journey in Genesis. And he's called by God to deliver a stern message of judgment to the leadership, the people in power. He's grieved at how the rich and influential treat the poor. And he turns his rebukes upon anyone who would do that in the name of his God. 
A third of the, of the book exposes the sins of, of his fellow countrymen. Another third pictures the punishment God is about to send. And the final third holds out the hope of restoration once the discipline has ended. They will be disciplined. And here's Micah 6, 8. He's told you, old man, what is good. So, so they have, if you think about what, how, what these people hear, what is good? When they hear good, how do they define good? They define good by the moral law. It is good to worship God only. It is good not to reduce him to an image. It is good to when you take up his name, you take it up not in vain, in an empty mean, but in righteousness. Because of his righteousness and because of the cause of righteousness he's called you to. It is good to honor him, to keep his day holy. It is good to obey parents and, and in that context teach people to obey authority. Let me say something about the shootings that are going on here in our country. You probably experienced some of this. When I grew up, we had in our parking lot, in our high school, pickup truck after pickup truck after pickup truck that had a loaded gun right across the gun rack in the back of the truck. Loaded. No one was ever shot. It was unheard of. We got into fist fights from time to time. But even in that, no one thought in a fist fight, I'm going to get my gun. It never happened. We have, we have become a culture where we've said God is not welcome in our schools. You can't, you can't mention God. You can't promote the true and living God. At the same time, some of these same schools are saying, but we will make a prayer room available for Muslim students to go and pray five times a day or how many times it happens in the course of their schooling. The Bible is no longer acknowledged. I have... In my library, a book I found on my mother's bookshelf after she passed away. It was a it was a textbook used in her school. It was from it was published in Dallas, but it's it's the Bible survey for high school students in public schools. You can't remove God, His Word, the Ten Commandments. I remember very well growing up. We would. We would have a reading from the scripture in the morning. Uh, we would pray. The Ten Commandments were hanging prominently on the wall. We would say the pledge over the loudspeaker that would come and lead all of us in the pledge. You can't remove all those things and think you have created a vacuum. What you have done is you've created something that all manner of evil will be sucked into. And the reason our culture is where it is today is because there has been an intentional, aggressive, Attempt to forget God. He's told you what is good. Respect life, sixth commandment. Respect marriage, seventh commandment. Respect property. You don't steal what's not yours. Parenthetically, the eighth commandment. You shall not steal. When you study it closely, you realize it's talking about stealing people. You shall not treat a culture in such a way so that you raise up a slave culture by dangling free things in front of them. You shall honor truth. I think if I ever heard a politician speak the truth the first time, I would probably pass out. They are liars. Serial liars. But they're not the last ones. Truth has fallen in the streets. You may be reading the newspapers and hearing about the 18 school shootings since January 1st. That is a devil's lie. You do not count a student taking his own life while on the school grounds. You do not count a student accidentally discharging a police officer's weapon when the police officer was there to talk to him about law enforcement. You don't count those as school shootings. That is, that is a lie. Honor the truth. 
And then the tenth one. Be content. Don't be covetous. He has shown you what is good. They they have a standard, an unchanging standard called moral law. And we do too. And what does the Lord require of you? In the light of what God says is good, what does He require? It is to practice justice. Do justice is the the word that uh, is shorthand for practice. It is to practice justice. To be fair. We do not want more than our own. We do not want to hurt other people. We practice justice. We have, a, we have a just standard. It reflects the character of our God. It calls us, the second table of the law calls us how to relate to one another. Practice justice. To love kindness. That's to, that's to show mercy. To love being kind. We don't glory in being mean. We don't glory in grinding others to powder. We don't glory in in one-upping people. To love showing kindness. And, And in order to accomplish that, to practice justice and to love showing kindness, to walk humbly with our God, to remember one of the most dangerous things that can happen to a child of God is to forget that you too, and this is all through the Old Testament. Remember, you too were once slaves in Egypt. When we forget what we were before we were converted, it's a dangerous position to be in. And so this good that he sets before the people uh, is the standard. It's, it's, a, it's a direct application of the Ten Commandments. And then the name, his name Micah, uh, is, is Micaiah who, who is like God. Who is like God? That's what the name means. It's shortened to Micaiah. And so in chapter 7, verse 18, one of the the key verses there, who is a God like you? Well, his his hometown is is Morasheth Gath. Look at chapter 1, verse 14. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Morasheth Gath. The houses of Akzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. This place was located, one writer said, about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem uh, on the border of Judah and Philistia, where the Philistines lived. It was near Gath of the Philistines. You may recall Goliath of what? Goliath of Gath. So, like his cohort Amos, Micah was from the country. He was a country prophet. Don't know anything about his family or his occupation. Uh, He was not, from what we can tell, when you compare him, he's been been called a little Isaiah. But when you compare him and Isaiah, Isaiah was much keenly aware, having been raised in the royal court, much keenly aware of the political climate, as Daniel was. But what you, what you come across with Micah, if, if Isaiah speaks more to the international political scene, Micah speaks more to the human tragedy going on of suffering. Look at Micah 3.8, where he again thunders his call, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and might. Get that justice, right? To declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. I have a, I have a burning desire to see justice among the people of God. When was it written? I told you a while ago, uh, 730 or so B.C. But when you start reading in this, if you look at Micah 1, 6, Therefore I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour down her stones in the valley and uncover her foundations. You, You realize that in this time frame, Jotham was a king that ruled from 739 to 731. Ahaz, 731 to 715. And then Hezekiah, 715 to 686. These were kings of Judah. Much of his ministry took place uh, uh, before the Assyrian captivity of, of Israel, 722. So that's why the 730 date is used. 
He denounced, when you read through it, idolatry and immorality. So this would be before, if you if you remember what we studied in the Kings, Hezekiah was a reforming king. This would take place before the, re, the reforms of Hezekiah. So 735 to 710 B.C. He was a contemporary of Hosea, by the way. You're going to know that. We, uh, in the northern kingdom and of Isaiah in the court of Jerusalem. During the ministry of, of Micah, the kingdom of Israel continued to crumble inwardly and outwardly until its collapse in 722. Just so you know, I don't know if I, if I put this on the screen or not. The Assyrian Empire was led by Tiglath-Pileser III and Shalmaneser. Did I put that there? Didn't. And then Sargon II and then Sennacherib. Uh, and it became an increasing threat to Judah. At that time, as I said earlier, Babylon was still under domination and dominion uh, by Assyria. So listen to Micah 4.10. Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. Again, that would, they could not fathom that. Why would they go to Babylon? There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So what's the theme and purpose of, of, of Micah? Well, when you study through the book and read through it, Micah exposes the injustice of Judah and the righteousness and justice of Yahweh. It's a great contrast. The people of God who are supposed to bear his name, his image bearers, his, his covenant people who, with whom uniquely he has made this covenant, they reflect the exact opposite of his character. He is righteous. He is just. And the people at all levels, in all arenas, are unjust. It reminds you of Paul talking about in Romans 11 about the, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. He, uh, he recognizes God's good character, and yet he recognizes that when, when, pe- when his people ignore the opportunity and the privilege of reflecting him, then you face the severity of God because you've besmirched his name. That's what they were doing. This prophecy, perhaps more than any of the others we've studied, connects this this idea, the relationship between true spirituality and social ethics. We cannot in our day, we cannot in our day be growing spiritually as we should and unconcerned about the Holocaust upon our nation, which is abortion. We need to call out the hypocrites, those who are writing now saying, well, we need to, we need to do this about guns, that about guns. I, I ask them, you believe in abortion? Yeah. I'm not listening to you then. Because for, for you, the issue is, if a baby happens to make it alive out of the mother's womb, then suddenly we're supposed to be concerned for this child. And God calls us to be concerned for all human life, in utero and postpartum. And so we cannot be without concern. We cannot be without concern for the the, uh, opioid epidemic sweeping our country, taking thousands of lives. For a government system that, that does its best work when it keeps its people in poverty. This is injustice. And Christians ought to be speaking the loudest and the clearest and the most compassionate, clear word of the Lord that this is not right. These are, these are fellow human beings, creatures made in the image of God. And so this, this prophecy challenges us at this point, I think, that Micah 6, 8, I think it just burns into our conscience. We're to practice justice. We're to love showing kindness. We must not be in the name of religion or religious zeal or religious involvement like the, the priest and the Levite who walk on the other side of the road when the man half beaten to death and robbed is lying in the ditch. We must be the most merciful. We must be the most compassionate. We must be the most caring. We must stand in the gap. We must speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, the Scripture says. Micah calls us to this. What about keys? 
Well, the key phrase, of course, would be no surprise, the judgment and restoration of Judah. The key verses, we read them at the outset. I'll just cite them again. Micah 6, 8, which speaks of what God has required. Micah 7, 18, that asks the, the rhetorical question, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression? The good news is he does not retain his anger forever. He loves, he delights in showing mercy. He delights in steadfast love. And the key chapters, because of this courtroom scene that comes up and because of the final lifts, is chapters 6 and 7 really constitute the key chapters of this prophecy. Well, where do we see Jesus in Micah? Well, there's a couple of things we've already read that you go, I know, I know that, I know exactly where we see. Micah 5, 2. Uh, this passage is probably one of the clearest and most important of all the Old Testament prophecies when it comes to our Savior, Jesus. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Bethlehem remembers, remember, it's called the house of David. It means uh, Bethlehem, Bet, house, lahem, bread, the house of bread, the house where the bread of life was born into the world. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. It's about the, the birthplace and the eternity of Jesus. And by the way, this was made 700 years before Jesus was born. When the, when the chief priests and scribes were questioned in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 about this. Here's how they answered. They were asked about the birthplace of Messiah. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and they quote this passage in Micah, You, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You look at the, the content of the prophecy itself, he gives us some of the best descriptions in the Old Testament of this righteous reign of Christ that could be expected over the whole world. Let's listen to a few of them. Micah 2, 12 to 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, and noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate. Going out by it, their king passes on before them. The Lord at their head. Then again, Micah 4, verses 1 to 8. Listen to this. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills. Get that picture here, the highest. So it, its, its mountain top will tower over the it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. This idea of the peoples, as, as the nations. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes. For strong nations far away, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is the ultimate, the ultimate rule and reign of the Prince of Peace. When wars and rumors of war shall cease, and he shall reign, as Revelation says, forever and ever. And their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. There's the experiencing the blessing of the Lord. Not, not now nations, but every man. The personal experiential blessing that will come from going to the mount of the Lord and meeting this one who is coming in the name of the Lord. 
No one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all the peoples will walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off, a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Zion. In other words, the people, the daughter of Zion, the people of God, will experience this incredible blessing because of the king that God is sending for them. Then Micah 5, 4, listen to this. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. You cannot read that and not remember that Paul's saying in Ephesians 2, 20, and he himself is their peace who has torn down the middle wall of partition, separating the two, this, the ceremonial law, which, which was in handwriting and ordinances, which kept Jew and Gentile apart. He himself is their peace, making peace with God, bringing them by grace to make peace with one another and make of the two one new humanity. Paul teaches that. He will be their peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will rise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. We will have more than enough to match anybody who would invade and bring harm to the people of God. Well, I said to you earlier, as far as Micah's contribution to the Scripture, he is, he's considered a mini-Isaiah. And there's a lot of passages, and we won't take the time tonight to read them, where you could compare the language of Micah and Isaiah about how they're saying some of the same things. Well, the difference, Micah focused on moral and social problems. Isaiah put greater stress on the world affairs and political concerns. But as I said earlier, I think it's the context here is where they come from. Micah comes from the country. Isaiah comes from the courts of, of of uh, of the political leaders. Here's an interesting note that I found. There's a quote from Micah 3.12 that would come from Jeremiah a century later concerning the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And when it's given and you read through the context of Jeremiah, it becomes a means that God uses to deliver Jeremiah from certain death. Let's look at these, just compare them. Look at Micah 3.12. Therefore, because of you, Zion... Because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Look at Jeremiah 26, 18. This is the prophet Jeremiah speaking. A hundred years later, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and said to all the people of Judah, thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. The people were angry with Jeremiah. If you remember when we studied through that, they didn't like what he was saying. Yet they could not deny in this part of his prophecy that he was citing one of the prophets. And they knew about that. And it, and it caused them to back away. Micah also is quoted in the New Testament. This is interesting. Micah 5, 2, that passage we've read several times, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, remember this, who, who are so small, you can't be counted among the, the clans of Judah. Look at, look at Matthew 2, 5, and 6. They answered and told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And they quoted this. We saw this a while ago. So, so the New Testament acknowledges the value of Micah and what he has to say about the coming Messiah. Also look at John seven forty two. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there's this citation of what Micah the prophet says uh, about where the Messiah would be born. Then in Micah 7, 6, look at this. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Does that sound familiar? It should Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36, Jesus says, Do not think 
I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her brother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus cites Micah so that people don't misunderstand when they, when they call him a troublemaker, that he did not come to bring peace on their terms. But when they want him to compromise, when they want him to be a Messiah on their terms, when they want him to come and not upset the apple carts of their lives, he says, no, in that case, what I bring is a, is a sword. Because there'll be people in your household, some who will come and embrace me, some who will not. And they will not find common ground again. We read about this all the time, by the way, when we're on Wednesday nights when we're going through the, the countries that we're praying for every week. When a believer, primarily in a Muslim country, when someone comes to know Christ, their family turns against them. In some cases, it is their family that will carry out what's called an honor killing to kill them because they have betrayed the prophet of Islam. Then in Mark 13, let's see a couple of things here about this same uh, passage in, in Micah 7, 6. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And then again, Luke 12, 53. They'll be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. The gospel, folks. The gospel divides. I hear people say from time to time, preachers say, well, we just don't need to preach things that are divisive. Well, then you can't preach the gospel. The gospel divides. When it comes into a home where heretofore all of the members of that home had been unconverted, maybe settling for being nominally religious, and the gospel lays hold by the grace of God and changes the heart of a member of that home, and they begin to hear the heartbeat come out from among them and be separate. And the hostility comes to that person. They've been saved. They're not settling for, for empty religion, nominal religion anymore. They're not set, settling for a God as they want to understand them or they'd like to believe that he is. The gospel divides. It always has. It always will. We need to know that when we preach the gospel. When you lay down the claims of Christ... And some embrace them. Some are going to reject them. Paul wrote about this over and over in his letters. We're bound to thank God for you in Thessalonians. Brethren, love to God, for we know that our gospel did not come to you in word only, but it came to you in power, strength, and the Holy Spirit producing deep conviction. He talked about the difference. All the folks in that area heard him preach, but not all responded. So we need to, we need to remember that. that. Let me say something. That is not say that we need to be odd for God or, or pugilanimous and try to pick a fight. No, no. Just live the gospel. It divides. It separates. In anticipation of the ultimate separation between the sheep and the goats at the last day. Let's be sure, and I tell people this all the time, and I want to be this. Let's be sure that we are magnanimous, that we are winsome. And our love for Jesus and our declaration of him to those friends, loved ones, neighbors, enemies who are unconverted. But let's also be prepared that no matter how winsome we may be, no matter how magnanimous we may be, no matter how peace we may be. The psalmist said, I, I was for peace. And when I spoke peace, they wanted war. No matter how we must try. People will resent us, hate us, say all manner of evil against us falsely. <laughs> Jesus says, for my sake and for the gospel. Micah teaches us that. It's risky to live the gospel. It doesn't cost us a whole lot here yet, but it will. It will. It costs our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, their very lives, their very existence. So you see this influence, this contribution that this small prophecy has made uh, on the whole scripture. And I hope this has been kind of a helpful overview for you tonight. I want to ask you before we close 
uh, do you have any questions or comments or observations about anything? Maybe I, I know always when I'm reading through things, and I hope you're tracking, you're reading, some things may come out to you uh, that you that you observe and you want to share. So before we wrap it up, any any questions, comments, observations? Anybody?